All right. Um, how many of you are still married this week? <laughs> yes. Each other. Oh, to each other. Excellent. Okay. That is good news. I'm so glad. I'm so excited. Thank you guys for having me last week. Um, and uh, I know that I shared a little bit of my own uh, personal struggle with marriage uh, for 10 years. My husband and I uh, battled with all of this. We have by no means arrived, but I am more in love with him today than I ever have been. Um, marriage is more than I really ever thought it could be. Um, and so for those of you who are a little bit back maybe where I was, there's hope and it gets better. And uh, hang in there. And I tell you, we are just coming into this amazing chapter called The Empty Nest. It is the best. <laughs> the best. I'm telling you, when you guys put your heart and soul into your kids and you work day after day, you teach them about who God is and they grow up to be responsible individuals, and you are so blessed and you are so blessed that their socks are not on your floor and you are not spending 600 bucks at Costco just to the next day not have anything to eat, right? So, uh, empty nest, love it. If you're not there yet, come talk to me. If you're worried about, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Uh, don't worry. It is so great waking up and not seeing them every day. <laughs> So um, last week, it was so good to kind of dive into this whole area of spiritual warfare. Uh, we uh, looked at uh, lots of different things. We looked at um, what the scripture says about Satan, some of his tactics, some of his names, um, and that the demonic world is a reality, and how we need to be sober-minded and alert um, so that we can recognize spiritual opposition in our lives. And where we may have given him a crack, right? He's always looking, always looking for that opportunity. I don't know why, but the whole visual, I don't know if you guys watch The Mandalorian or if you watch any of the Star Wars stuff, but you know, you'll see it Yoda at times, he'll do his little Yoda thing, and he creates this kind of force field around them. And the enemies fire and, and arrows and, and, and weapons are coming at him, and they are safe under this force field. And for some reason, I just picture that around you, around me, as we walk with the Holy Spirit, as we make sure that our sin is confessed and taken care of, and he covers us. So I want you to know that you are protected as believers in Christ. You are under the protection of the Almighty. So Satan is not something that you need to be fearful. You do not need to be awake at night. You do not need to, to, to freak out on, on, on all the things that Hollywood portrays. You are a child of the King of Kings who has the power that, that raised Jesus from the dead. That's your power. You do not need to be afraid of this. This is not something that needs to leave you fearful. So if you are fearful, there, there might be the opportunity to look and say, do I understand whose I am? Because when you do, that fear diminishes and you take your rightful place. So we talked about his tactics and his desires for us to be deceived. He wants you to believe things about your spouse that may not be true. Um, we, we looked at taking thoughts captive, feeding the right dog, Good morning. Um, being transformed by the renewing of our minds. And uh, thank you for your questions. Tons of good questions. And I'm going to um, attempt to answer as many of them as I can today. As we go through, there will be some that are um, unanswered. And I apologize for that. Um, you can find me here at Venture uh, if you want to sit down and, and discuss some of those, some good stuff. So thank you guys for thinking about that. So this week, I want to talk about a very practical approach to spiritual warfare as it pertains to your marriage. Okay, Amy, we, we've heard about Satan, his, his tactics and his schemes, um, but how does that look with me in, in my marriage? And I realize that a million things could be affecting your marriage negatively. Your spouse's mistakes, 
your mistakes. Different personality styles, expectations, a lack of communication, in-law issues, finances, the Silicon Valley pace, um, sickness, disagreements, family issues. Even now as I'm describing them, your heart rate starting to increase, you're like, yep, I got that one. Or more than likely, yeah, we got all of those. Or most of them. These things create issues and they create problems and our gaze shifts to our spouse. How come this? How come that? But those, those things and your spouse is not the enemy of your marriage. You do have an enemy, regardless of how you feel about your spouse. They are not the enemy. Behind all the junk and the unrealistic messages, the personal failings and the conflicts that life brings, the enemy is out to destroy you and your marriage. His sole goal is to devour you. He's behind the culture of divorce. He's behind infidelity. He's behind addiction and abuse. That's him. He loves it. He's all about it. And he's behind the apathy that often sets in when the marriage misery takes root. The enemy of your marriage is God's enemy. We looked last week at the very specific way that God tells us where our struggles is. It's not against flesh and blood. So what does that negate? That negates your spouse. That's not where your struggle lies. The enemy's looking, and he's going to look at ways that he can, he can get you and work there, but, but this is not, this is clear. We, we struggle against the powers of darkness that are constantly at work. So we've established the true struggle, right? And I'm guessing most of you in the room would say, yeah, okay, we, we, we get it. Um, my battle is, is beyond my spouse. It's a, it's a spiritual one. So what about my marriage? Why would the, my marriage be of any particular interest to the devil? Have you ever thought of that? Why would the devil be interested in us? I mean, doesn't he have bigger fish to fry? <clears throat> doesn't he have some Hitlers to work on or something? I mean, we're just trying to do life here. Why us? Here's why. You guys might not be able to read that. I apologize. Marriage is designed to reflect God and his relationship that he has with this church. Biblical marriage points people towards God. It's a picture uh, and a witness to this world about how Christ loves you. It's good and it's holy. And what does Satan hate most? Oh, he hates it when God gets glory. He hates it. Of course, your marriage is a prime target for someone who wants to make a mockery of God and steal his glory. Marriage is an incubator for the next generation to grow in their knowledge and relationship with God. Satan wants to destroy the next generation. Satan hates your kids. He wants to devour, derail, diminish, dilute, destroy them. Satan will use a contentious, miserable marriage to turn the incubator of faith into a toxic chamber of unbelief. Studies show that next to parental hypocrisy, a Christ dishonoring marriage in which there is no gospel in action has the potential to be fatal to your child's view of Christian faith. Next is uh, a godly marriage is one of the best testimonies to the unbelieving world. The world is watching and miserable mad, bad marriages are a terrible, terrible testimony. I want to see if God makes a difference. Huh. Look at them. They look the same as we do. Hmm.
A bad marriage, godly, a, a godly marriage is one where the spouse and the, and the serve in the church, where two people are serving in the church. Um, Satan seeks to sideline Christian service. Although Christians in bad marriages may serve, often they don't. Why? They're consumed with their own stuff. They can't see it outside of them. Leaving their spiritual gifts uninvested, and the church suffers from a consumerism mentality, and the Christian struggles with feeling a lack of fulfillment and purpose. When you serve, it becomes about others. And whenever we spend too much time having it be about us, it's dark. God didn't create us to be all about us. When you give your life away is when you start to grow and you understand why the church exists and what you're here for. So there's a lot on the line. There's a lot on the line. A good marriage is far more than just you feeling good about how you and your spouse are interacting. Spiritual warfare is a real thing and we would be in error to believe that your marriage is not a target. Okay? So, we get it. We're in a spiritual battle. Now what? How do I fight? In any battle, the weapon that you choose will have a tremendous impact on the outcome. For instance, remember the, the rattlesnake story, for those of you who weren't with uh, us last week, uh, I had a, a diamondback rattlesnake in, in the window well of our home, and he was uh, coiled up and hissing, ready to strike. Looking at me, I'm looking at him. My children and myself remember where we are, we're on the table uh, watching, even the dogs there, and uh, we were really eagerly depending on my husband to come in and to save the day. He had chosen the right weapon for the job. And here's what he chose. My husband's familiar and skilled with using guns. This one in particular, it's a 22 rifle. And for this predator, he knew the right ammunition would be snake shot. So he loaded it up and he had familiarized himself long ago with gun safety strategy and he effectively knew that the power that it possessed. He was paying attention. He was alert and he shot that thing. Done. Now, what would have happened if he showed up with this? <laughs> First of all, the encounter would have looked vastly different. No doubtedly, I would have thought, he's lost his mind, and wondered if he was totally oblivious to how this thing's supposed to go down. I mean, we might still be there uh, squirting a really wet snake. Ineffective. Choosing the correct weapon is key. It's key for spiritual warfare as well, so we must be savvy to the devil and his ways and guard ourselves against his schemes. So perhaps the best example uh, of all is found in Luke chapter 4. Jesus had been in the wilderness for 40 days. The body is technically, medically starving. Um, and he was feeling low. His body was in dire need, and Satan, being Satan, always looking, said, ah, this is prime. I'm going to go in now. And three times he tried to derail Jesus using a temptation, and Jesus' response was the same each time. It is written. Jesus used scripture to battle Satan's temptation, not some elaborate spiritual power that's inaccessible to you, to me. Three times he responds to the temptation by saying it is written and Jesus fought this battle as a spirit-filled, word of God-filled man. He drew on no divine resources that are unavailable to you. You and I have what Jesus used. And what happened? The devil left.
This is, wasn't the, the healing of the dead man. This, this, this wasn't giving the blind sight. This was the scripture and the Holy Spirit, which, by the way, you have both. The correct weapon in spiritual warfare is truth. It's God's truth. That's the counter weapon with which we can resist and be transformed. Here, by renewing our minds. Romans 8 says, For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. Are you a believer? The Holy Spirit resides in you. You're the temple. You're his casa. What's your mind set on? I wish my spouse would change. I'm so unhappy. Man, this marriage is hopeless. I'm just going to work, work more, get out of it. I, I don't want to deal with it. I, I, I'm not happy. What do you allow in your epicenter? This is the epicenter. What you believe determines what you value, what you commit to, how you think and feel, and ultimately your actions. What are you allowing? What takes up most of your thoughts? Are you able to discern between truth and the fake? How vigilant are you taking every thought captive? So United States federal agents don't learn to spot counterfeit money by studying the counterfeits. They study the genuine bill until they master the look of the real thing. The approach to distinguishing a genuine bill is with this phrase, touch, tilt, look at, and look through. They spend hours and days and weeks, so much time with the genuine thing that when a bogus bill comes through, they can instantly spot it. How good are you recognizing the bogus? Oh, these thoughts, man, these are bogus. This is not the genuine thing. I'm gonna take that thought and I'm gonna, I'm gonna take it captive. And I'm gonna take the truth and I'm gonna replace it. And what happens is your brain begins to make different neuro connections, literally transforming the physical makeup of your brain. Did God know this when he said, take every thought captive, be transformed by the renewing of your mind? Yes, he knew that. Neuroscientists are just now understanding that. He knew that. The problem is, is that some of our pathways are so wide and so big and so smooth that something happens and boom, we just go down that same path. I'm nothing. I'm a failure. I'm unworthy. I'm unlovable. I'm unforgiven. How do we transform. You take it captive and you bring it as it comes in. You say, no, not today. This is what's true. And it feels super awkward at first. Super awkward. Like learning a new skill. Like going to the gym when you haven't worked out in 15 years. Trying to get that muscle engaged again. You're like, oh. And over time, and over the mental discipline of getting yourself there and doing it, you begin to change. And you wake up and you're thinking different things. And the falsehoods are beginning to diminish. And you wake up and you go, today, God, today is about you. Today is about loving you, loving others. Today is about the way that I interact with the most important person on this earth that you have given me, my spouse. How do I love them well? Lord, it's not going to be easy, but I'm spirit-filled. The power, the power is mine. 
we will do this thing. You're going to equip me with what I need. Oh, Amy, it's too hard. I can't do it. I've been doing it for years. He's enough. Get out of the way. Empty yourself of you. And get to work. Love your spouse. What did he ask you to do? He asked you to love your spouse. To respect your spouse. Where are you at? How you doing? Spending time understanding the character of God, his heart, his purpose for your life, the things that he wants for you to be about. They help you to, to discern the bogus, the ideas and the falsehoods. Thoughts from our own sin nature and our own culture come in and get mixed in with that. And it leaves us susceptible to spiritual attack. So, how do we know? How do we know? Is there a, a big light that flashes up? Oh, spiritual oppression, here it is, here it is. Satan's in, in route, GPS, okay, location, Satan. Oh, oh, he's at my address. What? Wouldn't that be nice? Is this spiritual warfare? Is my spouse just a jerk? How can I know if this is a human dynamic, a personality issue, a, a family of origin, or preferences, wounds from on his radar, and wants to mess it up? And your spouse is a human, and so are you. Those both are true. Yes, you're under attack. And yes, growing in marriage is a process that takes serious work. You know that. That's why you're here. Both things are true at the same time. So your strategy should always involve a two-prong approach. You've got to pray for protection. My image is that, that force field, that invisible shield. Pray, Lord, protect me. Protect my spouse. Protect our children as we go through this life. Help us to discern, help us to see when there are areas in our relationship that are leaving us vulnerable. And get to work. Marriage is a lot of work. The best things in life are a lot of work. It's not one or the other, it's both simultaneously. So, I want to give you a couple practical steps. I want you to be able to go home and begin to work uh, at, 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 on this whole thing. So, number one, make conflict a trigger. What do I mean by that? When we make conflict a trigger, we ask God for wisdom right at the beginning. Uh, I see something's about ready to go down here, the same hot topic. Man, he's doing that thing again. She's doing that thing again. Lord, help me now. Give me the wisdom to do what it is that you're asking me to do. It's saying, I'm frustrated, Lord. I'm hurt and I'm angry. And man, I just want to verbally vomit all over. I want to give full vent to my, to my fury. And you say, help me think clearly and Lord, block the enemy from having his way here with us. What if every conflict was a trigger? Lord, I need you. I can't do this one because I, in myself, don't have it. And he goes, I know. I got you. Let's go. Philippians 4 tells us, in everything by prayer and supplication, in everything, Everything's pretty clear. What does everything involve? Everything. It's a component, prayer is a component in dealing with every marital challenge, no matter how big or small. When's the last time you said, oh Lord, he's an hour late. Help me be wise. Protect the enemy here and help me to do this thing the way that would please you. 
with thanksgiving. Oh, what? You want me to be thankful? My spouse is super irritating. And I'm supposed to be thankful right now? Or, 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 what? The spirit of gratefulness? Let me tell you something that helped me through the years. On this earth, your goal is holiness. I'm guessing that most of you in this room want to reflect Christ and look more like him. On that day when you stand before him and he asks an account, you want to say, Lord, I, I, I did the things you asked me to do and my character was built and, and my goal was holiness. The person that you are married to will be the primary relationship that God uses to refine you. Oh. Hey guys, after this, let's all go out and get refined. I probably wouldn't have too many people to hop in my car to come with me, right? Refinement. But ultimately, refinement is the, the, the purging of the things that don't look like him, right? God's going to use your spouse more than anyone else to do this. Marriage is the great searchlight. And often shows us the things about ourselves that are not so lovely. And sometimes, rather than looking at those things, we want to say, it's your fault. It's you. But as followers, our deep desire is to look more and more like Jesus. Your spouse and all those little things that drive you crazy. What if they drove you to your knees? God, what are you doing in my life through this conflict? What are you teaching me? Thank you for using my spouse as an instrument for my growth. You don't want to look the same today as you do tomorrow or the next day. You want to grow. You want to be different. What if he's using that marriage that's difficult to get you there? What? All of a sudden, God gives us this thankful spirit that we may not have had our own, and we say, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this. Because life, it, 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 life in you is not about this temporary breath, this vapor. It's about eternity. And I want to look the most like you as I can when I get there. And if you're going to use conflict and these dynamics in my life to do so, let's go. Let's get it. Let's do it. You don't stand before God on that day with your spouse. It's about you and him. What's he doing? What if this hard marriage is exactly what he wants for you? Because he's teaching you something. All of a sudden, it has value. Conflict trigger. Conflict done right, conflict done God's way, is the highway to intimacy. Second, unhook. So let me see, by show of hands, anybody been repelling? in the room. Okay, cut one, two, oh, okay, a few of you. Now, when you rappel down a mountain, you make sure you've got this thing on, okay? You hook in, you and, you and five of your friends are going, and you're going you're gonna to go to um, Yosemite. <laughs> you hike up half dome, wow, I really made this an extreme rappel. Yeah, up, up half dome, you, you hook in, right? And you're going to rappel, and there's four or five of your friends, and they're going down, and this is important. This is really important. And so you get on and you hook into that line. That is your life. You screw in and you, you're, you're harnessed up and you're like, okay, your friends have gone down and they're like, yeah, it's awesome, let's go. And you're like, all right, here we go. I don't know why I'm talking about like you sound like that. but And so you begin to rappel down and it's awesome and you love it. And you're a little nervous, you're a little afraid and your feet hit the ground and you are hooked in, and your friends go, hey, let's go check out Vernal Falls. And you go, hey, you guys go ahead. I'm going to stay hooked in. And you say, oh, well, come on, there's, there's lots to see. It's amazing here. And you go, you know, I'm good. I'm just going to 
stay right here, hooked in. Well, but there's lots to see. You say, ah, ah, ah. I'm just going to stand here and look at the mountain. Forgiveness is unhooking. Those things that are done to you, have been done to you, that are offensive, you've got to unhook. You've got to get out of that so that you can see what God has for you. So you've got to unhook quickly. You've got to extend grace. Man, she did it again. That thing that I hate. Unhook. Quickly. Because Satan's looking. He's looking. Ah, I see a gap. I see that crack. I'm going in. And resentment and bitterness creep in. We know it. And it can divide you. You've got to fight it. It's easy to feel resentful. It's easy to feel bitter. It's hard to release it. But there's way too much at stake for you to hold on. You're missing life. You're standing there looking at the mountain, the mountain of your spouse's mistakes or the, the wrongs that were done, and you're missing the, what God has intended and prepared for you. Be aware that the enemy of your marriage works best by fanning these flames. He wants to keep it going. When you unhook and release, now you're free. And guess what? The divine romance continues to grow. And when that romance continues, this earthly one, oh, watch out, baby. It'll blow your mind. But if you don't move swiftly at the first feelings of resentment towards your spouse, you may find contention hiding in your home. Hebrews 12 warns us how the roots of bitterness causes trouble and defiles many relationships. And this begins in your marriage and then it spills over into your children, to the people at church, to your friends. In my career as a coach, people come in feeling stuck. They speak of the challenges that they're dealing with and some of the issues that are in front of them, things that just, they just feel like they can't overcome. And often, not always, but often, when we really get down to peeling back the layers, there is often a lack of forgiveness towards someone or themselves. It can cause you to, to, to become stuck and, and the freedom that you're longing for is, is out of reach. Where are you? If we went down to those real deep inner parts, what would we find? Resentment? Bitterness? Is there unforgiveness? Towards your spouse, your, your parents, your sibling, co-worker? How's that working for you? If you feel like it would be helpful to walk with a trained coach, that's why we're here. Venture offers that resource for you and I want to encourage you to begin to do the work. Life's short. There's a lot to see and it requires you to unhook. Lastly, work on yourself. Here's the biggest practical issue. Uh, the only person that you can change is you. So often couples will come in and they have a million things on their list and I say, oh, let's take your spouse off the table. Are you willing to look at you? As much as we wish we could change our spouse because we'd make them exactly who we want them to be, we cannot. And you may have spent some time trying. You can't force them. You can pray for them and influence them. You can communicate with them. If you're waiting for them to change, you're going to be continually frustrated, discouraged, and bitterness and resentment will be a constant present. 
here's the good news. Your spouse, if they are a believer, has the Holy Spirit as a guide. You are not him. Some of you need to be need to resign from being God in the in the life of your spouse. It's not your job. And my guess is you're underqualified. Instead, work on being a, a better spouse. Lord, what can I do today to bless my spouse? I know my needs aren't met and I know there's there's stuff, but Lord, it's about giving to you because this is about you and me. Take your spouse off the table. It's about here. Lord, how does this look to you, the way that I'm loving, the way that I'm acting, the way that I'm talking? How does this look? In closing, I want to note that prayer is so fundamental. For me, prayer is a constant dialogue. It's part of your DNA. It's every moment of your day. It's seeking the Holy Spirit. I need you right now. I don't want to miss this, Lord. It's submitting to the authority uh, uh, of him in your life so that, so that you can do the hard stuff. Marriage is hard. Forgiveness is hard. I know. The best things in life are hard. And because the star breather resides in you, you got this. You got this. Let me leave you with this. In all these things that we're talking about, you are more than a conqueror through him. Guess what, you guys? We win. We know the end. You're not fighting for victory. You're fighting from victory. You're already victorious. You have got this because of him. You are greater than the prince of this earth. Go out and claim who you are. Know whose you are. Know the truth so that you can spot the phony when he comes in and whispers that all too familiar thing. Say, that's fake. That's a counterfeit. Because I have spent time with the truth and I recognize that and go to battle. Let me pray. Lord, you are good. You love these people. You love them, Lord. You are so about them. You are so about their marriage, Lord. And they have an enemy that wants to dilute the glory that their marriage can bring to you. Thank you that they're here. Just the fact that they are sitting in that seat shows that they have a desire to move forward in their marriages. They have a desire to know you, Lord. And in that, there is going to be spiritual battle. Ah, but Lord, they're not playing with a squirt gun. They've got the real thing. Help them to go out and to, to look at one another that we are in this thing together. And we want to bring glory to the kingdom of God through our marriage. And there's some things that we need to get to work on. And guess what? The Almighty is already there. Thank you for them, Lord. And be with them now as they discuss in their groups, Lord. Would you just uh, give them a sense that, that you are for them and that you are the healer of their marriage. Thank you for marriage and all the joy that it brings, Lord, the next generation that, of godly people that are raised up in, in, in the marriages here, represented here, Lord. We praise you for all this, Lord. Thank you that you are more than enough. In Jesus' name, amen.